if we just had a message for just mothers, then the fathers would go, why am I here? And, uh, and at the same time, the mothers are going, really preach something because he really needs it, so make sure he gets it too today. And if it's just for mothers, then all the ladies who aren't mothers are going, why am I here? And so today what I'd like us to do is to get something where really it's for all of us, but I believe in a very particular way. It applies to women and mothers' wives specifically. Why? Well, several years ago, I married one of you women. And I have been amazed how it seems that Satan can lie to women and how easy they believe it. I'm amazed at when there's a mirror and the guy walks up to the mirror, he looks at it and goes, looking good. And the same mirror, the wife will walk by and go, oh gosh, I got to work on that. And I'm amazed how many times, no matter how much anyone says, you're beautiful, you're wonderful, you'll do it, they can always come back with, well, not really. And there's always an excuse, and there's always a, and basically, it's always a lie that Satan's thrown. If there's anything I want us to come back out of this service today and walk away from here, it's with this idea. God is on my side. God is on my side. I want you to open your Bibles, if you would, please, to the book of Psalms, Psalm 56. When I open up to that passage, Psalm 56, there's a, a little deal that's not part of the Bible per se, but it's just kind of an explanation of what's going on. And, and I found, I, a few years ago, I went through all 150 Psalms. Took one a day, uh, and I, on Psalm 119, it took more than one day because that was a little long. But, but as I was going through, as I was listening to someone teach about them, one of the things that I found very interesting was when they would give the background to the Psalm. And this is one of those which, when you know the background, it really helps you understand the Psalm. And in Psalm 56, in my Bible at least, it says this, a Psalm of David regarding the time the Philistines seized him in Gath. Now, how many of you in your Bible, you have that or something similar to it at the beginning? Anyone? Everybody got something? Even, I think, even on, on the phone, you, you have a little something sometimes that kind of gives an introduction. So, to understand what's happening in Psalm 56, we really have to go back to 1 Samuel chapter 21. And in 1 chapter 21, 1 Samuel 21, we find the story when David finds out through Jonathan, who was the prince, the, the King Saul's son, listen, my dad is out to kill you. You need to get away. It's not safe to go back to your house. It's not safe. You just need to run. And so David takes off. And as he's running, he finds a place where there was the tabernacle and where the priests were there. And, and he talked to them and he was very hungry. And he said, do you have anything to eat? And they said, the only thing we have is this religious bread that we've taken out of the tabernacle. And he said, well, I'm really starved. And he said, well, we just took this out yesterday. So he ate the bread. And then he said, do you happen to have any weapons? I, I ran off kind of fast, didn't tell him why he was running, didn't tell him who he was running from, but just said, I had to leave town rather fast, and I didn't even have a sword. And they said, well, the only sword we have is Goliath's sword. Now, you remember the story of David and Goliath. David went after Goliath with what? A slingshot, five stones. 
God directed that shot really good, killed Goliath, and then David went over and took Goliath's swords out, way bigger than he could handle, but since Goliath was on the ground dead, it made it a lot easier, and he takes the sword and he chops his head off. All of a sudden, everything goes crazy, the Philistines are running away, the Israelis are chasing after them, and so all of this is going on. Well, this is the only sword available, so he gets it, he straps it on, and he keeps running away. He's running and running and runs outside the city, outside the, the boundaries of Israel, goes into the land of the Philistines, shows up in the town of Gath, which happened to be the hometown of Goliath, wearing Goliath's sword. Anybody see a problem here? We have a problem. So now he's there, and as he is there, things begin to happen. He is outside, he is in the hometown of Goliath, these people are sworn enemies of Israel and they have a particular dislike for Goliath because he killed their champion. He killed the one that was the best they had. And that day many others died. And there he shows up wearing the sword. We can find out from this that he was surrounded by his enemies. Maybe even he was in jail waiting for the king to decide, what am I going to do with him? Well, the first verse in chapter 22 lets us know that David escapes because he pretends to be crazy. I mean, he's just saying all kinds of stupidity, drooling all over the place. And finally the king goes, this guy's wacko. I don't, let's get rid of him and just let him go. And he escapes. But while he's there, in jail, or surrounded by the enemy, he writes this psalm. And later on, he gives it to the chief musician, and he says, Listen, here's what happened. I want you to keep this. And this is a very important one. Don't misplace this one. This is one of the, the big ones. I don't want you to lose. They even have written, at least in my Bible, it's to be sung to the tune of, and I have no idea what that tune is, so we won't get into that, okay? So here it is. What did David do in the midst of this amazingly precarious situation? Well, this is where Psalm 51 comes in. So if you have your Bibles, it says, Oh God, have mercy on me. For people are hounding me, my foes attack me all day long. First thing we need to understand, when he was in this situation, the first thing David did was appeal to God's mercy. He appealed to God's mercy. Why? Well, because remember, David had not gone to the Lord and said, Lord, where should I go? What should I do? David just took off and went where David thought he could get out of the problem he was in with Saul. He left the borders of Israel. He went into the enemy territory. And even though he messed up by not asking God where to go, once he found himself in the problem, he realized. I need mercy. I need God to reach down in this situation and help me out. Mercy is what we cry out for when we know that we deserve punishment. When, when the speed limit says 70 and the cop stops us because we're going 60, we don't holler out for mercy. In fact, we get kind of an attitude, like, why'd you stop me? But when we are going 85, and, and we did, now we put on our sweet face, right? We, we try to get this like, hi, how are you? 
You know, we, we try to be on our very best behavior. Why? Because we know that we deserve punishment. But our cry is for mercy. And David knew that God was a merciful God, so the first thing he does is cry out for his mercy. But then he continues on, verse 2. I am constantly hounded by those who slander me, and many are boldly attacking me. When I am af- but when I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. I praise God for what he has promised. I trust in God, so why should I be afraid? What can mere mortals do to me? The second thing he did, he trusted in God's promises. He trusted in God's promises. See, because one day he was out in the field taking care of his sheep, and somebody came running to him and say, Hey, David, they need you back up at Dad's house. You need to get up there. When he gets up there, he finds out that earlier in the day, Father had called all the brothers together except for him. And he called all the brothers together because Samuel had said, I want you to round up all your boys. I want to see because God is going to pick a new king. So from the oldest down, one by one, every one of them, and God is telling Samuel, this isn't it, this isn't it. And Samuel's going, but this guy looks really kingly. He, he really had that king look. And he goes, yeah, you're looking on the outside, but I'm looking on the inside. This is not it. This is not it. Goes through all the brothers, and he goes, is that all there is? And they say, well, there's, there's the one. You know, there, there's the one that's out there in the field. And they say, bring him in. So he brings him in. And at that point, it says that Samuel takes the oil, and he pours it on his head and says, you are going to be the next king of Israel. Now, I want you to notice something. This was a promise that he had made. This is, this is what God had said. God had promised David that he would be the king of Israel. Now, his enemies around him at that point are saying a bunch of things. They're saying things about him. They're saying things about what they're going to do. They're going to guarantee to him that, no, you, you killed our big guy. And so what we're going to do is we're going to get you in the middle. And all of us are going to get slingshots. And we're just going to throw rock after rock after rock after you. And then when you're really, really sore, then we're going to beat you up. And after we beat you up, we're going to get the sword. And we're going to cut your head off just like everything else. And David's going, but God said, I'm going to be king. God said, I'm going to be king. And so he trusted in what God said more than in the circumstances that he found himself in. Third thing that we see begins in verse number five says, they're always twisting what I say. They spend their days plotting to harm me. They come together to spy on me, watching my every step, eager to kill me. Don't let them get away with their wickedness. In your anger, O oh God, bring them down. You keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. My enemies will retreat when I call to you for help. This I know. God is on my side. The third thing we see that David did is he leaned on what he knew for certain about God. He knew what he knew about God. He knew that God was bigger and God was more powerful than all the enemies that he had around him. That he knew. In fact, he had told 
uh, Saul earlier on when he was going to go out and fight Goliath. He, he's going, he says, listen, I've seen God do amazing things. I've seen him give me the power, the, the knowledge, the, the everything to kill a bear and to kill a lion. And God has done this and I know God can do this too. But here he was in the midst of the most horrible situation you can imagine. Yet he knew God was bigger, God was more powerful than everybody around him. And he also knew that God knew what he was going through. I was talking with someone earlier today, and they said, you know, I was in a situation, and when I was going through the situation, for a minute it went across my mind, does God know I'm going through this? Have you ever thought that? Have you ever thought maybe God took a day off? Maybe, maybe I just missed something here that like he didn't know what's going on. But he's letting him know, no, God knew what he was going through. It says he knew every step he had taken. He knew exactly where he was. Not only that, he says that God had collected every tear he had cried. And collected it in a bottle. He had written down everything in a book. And he knew. He knew above everything else that God was on his side. He was not on the side of the Philistines. He was not on there. Now, he knew he wasn't perfect. He knew he wasn't where he was supposed to be. But God was a merciful God. God was one who had made many promises to him. And there's some things he knew for certain. And he knew that God was on his side. And then the last thing we see, beginning in verse 10. I praise God for what he has promised. Yes, I praise the Lord for what He has promised. I trust in God, so why should I be afraid? What can mere mortals do to me? I will fulfill my vows to you, O God, and will offer a sacrifice of thanks for your help. For you have rescued me from death, you have kept my feet from slipping, so now I can walk in your presence, O God, in your life-giving light. Notice what he said. He said he was going to turn the testing he was in, and he was going to turn it into triumph. He turned his testing into triumph. His first words were, I praise God. I praise God. Listen, God never will God never has broken a promise. It is this reality that God never breaks His promise that should give us a light at the end of a tunnel of chaos. Now let me explain this tunnel of chaos. Every time we're in a situation, every time that we, even when we want to do things right, there comes a moment in it where it just seems like there is no way out of this. The other night, I, I spent a few hours, had nothing else to do on Friday night, so let's go to the emergency room. And there's nothing like going to the emergency room to, to experience chaos up front. It's kind of organized chaos, but it is chaos. Everybody coming in is hurting. Everybody coming in has something. Everybody believes that what they have is the most important thing and want to be treated as the most important thing, right or wrong? Of course you do. Why? Because you're hurting. And everybody's hurting. And yet all of this stuff is going on, and sometimes when you're the one that's doing the hurting, you, you really have no idea. I remember one time I went in. And I went in because I had a pain that was real close to my chest. All you have to do to get really fast attention is you say, I have a pain in my chest. 
And believe me, they will give you attention really quick. Now, they'll give you attention and then they'll charge you for that attention a lot. But you will get attention. So don't try the, I broke my finger, but I'm going to say I have chest pains because you will pay for that one. But there they are. It's in the middle of this and you have no idea what's ahead. That's a tunnel of chaos. You're trying to get something wrong. You're trying to make something right in your life. You're trying to right a wrong. And yet in the middle of it, when you're trying to ask forgiveness, when you're trying to make it right, there comes a time when it can become a tunnel of chaos. You confess a sin that you have done. You're trying to make it right. But when the stuff hits the fan, It doesn't exactly seem like everything is going to work out. That's a tunnel of chaos. He says, I praise God. The praise becomes that light. He says, I trust in God. I trust in God. See, the love God has for us should dispel all fear. Never forget that God loves us and His love dispels fear. In fact, God said one time, if God is for us, who can be against us? If God is on your side, it doesn't matter who's on the other side. If God is on your side. He says, I praise you. I trust in God. And then these were amazing things in the last two verses. It says, I will fulfill my vows to you and will offer a sacrifice of thanks. Now again, he's surrounded by people who want to kill him. But in the midst of all of this, he is able to say, I know that I'm going to get out of this and I will fulfill my vows. I will offer a sacrifice. These were statements of faith. These were statements. This was putting into words what he knew in his heart. This is what we could call genuine hope in what was ahead. He said, I know. Now, he may not have known how. He may not have known when. But he knew in his heart that I'm getting out of this. I know because I trust in what God said. I can trust in who he is. I can trust in him. And I know that this will happen in the future and you're going well that that's really cool Russell that's very exciting I'm sure that David was happy and the end of the story yes he acted like a madman and they let him out go David go but what does that have to do with me what does that have to do with me let me give you four things. Number one, when I step away from God's best, He is merciful. Even when I step away from God's best, He is merciful. John Phillips, a gentleman who's written a commentary on every one of the Psalms. I have a couple of his books, and and he said the following regarding this Psalm. He said, God draws circles around us. He draws a circle around a child in a home. That's a circle of parental authority. He draws a circle around a wife in the home, the circle of her husband's positional authority. He draws a circle around the husband in the home, the circle of divine authority, authority vested in Christ. 
He draws a circle around the believer in the church, the circle of pastoral authority. He draws a circle around the citizen in the state, the circle of governmental authority. He draws similar circles around the rulers of a nation and around men and women in business. God expects us to recognize and respect these circles. Sometime he will enlarge a circle as when a wife becomes a mother or when an employee is promoted to a position of authority. But there are some circles outside which we are never to step. For to step outside them is to take oneself out of the sphere of protection the circle provides. David stepped across such a circle when he went down to Gath. He was no longer in the place of blessing. He was in a place in which his own unbelief and self-will had placed him. Their center and circumference of a blessed life. The other day I was thinking about this and working had nothing to do with this psalm. But this idea of of a blessed life being like a circle. The center of a blessed life is the perfection of God and the love of God. The perfection of God and the love of God. That's the center. In other words, what, what am I going to build my life around? Well, first of all... God loves me, and God is perfect. So everything that He gives me is going to be the perfect thing for me. Everything that comes from Him is coming from Him because He loves me, and so that is where I have to make it the center of my life. But then you have the circumference. Where does that go to? What should I be doing in my life? And the circumference is the Word of God and the ways of God. The Word of God says, go here, do this. Don't go there, don't do the other. The ways of God is, I work in these ways. I I, I work very differently from the world around me. And so my life, the best life I can hope for, is a life where the center is the perfection of God and the love of God and the extent to where my life goes out is as far as the Word of God and the ways of God put me. That is the best life I will ever have. But what happens? Sometimes, sometimes, inside here, there's still attacks. Remember, David was in Israel, and what happened? Saul sought to kill him. He he was still there inside the borders, but God had not told him to leave there. They're more easily defeated, these attacks and the tests and things. I can handle them better within this context. I remind you, Job was doing everything right. Job was living in this circle when God said to Satan, you see, my servant Job, he's living right in the circle. His life is right where it's supposed to be. And he said, well, sure, you're giving him everything. Take that all away and watch him move. So he said, okay, you can take it all away. Just don't touch him. So what did he do? He took it all away. And what did Job say? I've received from the Lord all of these things. Shall I complain when it's taken away? No. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And you're going, wow. Wow. Then he took away his health. Then he found himself sitting in a pile of ashes with pottery scratching his oozy scabs all over his body there's a wonderful thought for noon and yet and yet he was where he was supposed to be so yes there are going to be attacks but I tell you something 
when you get outside of these boundaries, that's where the real giants live. That's where things get really, really difficult. And we step outside the protection. Here's the constant danger. Now I want you to look at this. You remember when God was the center of your life and what God said, His word and His ways, you were doing everything within that? And yet, remember when somewhere along the way your center moved off to one side. Now, all of a sudden, you weren't right in. It was kind of like part in and part out of what God said. And then maybe you, you didn't correct. You didn't go back. You, you kind of kept going in this. And so now all of a sudden, the center of your life was not God, not what He said, not His love. It's what you thought. It's what you wanted. It, 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 it was you, you, you outside of God. Now, if you'll notice, even the one that's the furthest out, there's still a little piece back in there where God is. And, and there's people that come to church every week, and I guarantee you there's people here today that you haven't thought about God, you haven't put Him first, you have done what you wanted to do all week, and yet you sliced out a little piece of this week to be in church, and you're feeling so good about yourself. It's a constant danger. But let me tell you, even when you do this, God is a merciful God. It only takes a step of repentance. It only takes a step of admitting, I'm not where I should be. I'm not where God says is best and if you will step back God will say now we can keep moving the second thing that we see here with David and what it has to do with us is regardless of how I feel at any given moment God says that in Christ I when all of the circumstances of life are going well, they're all under control, we really don't have to exercise much faith. We, we really don't. I mean, we can kind of do it. Why? Because everything's going good. There are some 30,000 promises in the Bible. Now, I'll be honest. They're not all for you or for me. There's promises for different ones at different times. It has nothing to do. But we may not have 30,000 at our disposal, but I guarantee you there's a bunch of them there that are designed for you and for me today. And if we will go there, and if we will find them, and if we will believe them, and if we will live according to them, we will find that life will be much better than just doing things on our own. Regardless of how you feel. Inside your bulletin you have this little uh, insert. It's called the 20 cans. It's from the book Victory Over the Darkness. And, and just, just read along with me. Why should I say I can't? When the Bible says I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. What, why should I lack when I know that God shall supply all my needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus? Why should I fear when the Bible says God has not given me a spirit of fear but of power, love, and sound mind? Why should I lack faith to fulfill my calling knowing that God has allotted to me a measure of faith? Why should I be weak when the Bible says that the Lord is the strength of my life and that I will display strength and take action because I know God? Why should I allow Satan supremacy over my life when he that is in me is greater than he that is in the world? Why should I accept 
defeat when the Bible says that God always leads me in triumph? Why should I lack wisdom when Christ became wisdom to me from God and God gives wisdom to me generously when I ask Him for it? Why should I be depressed when I can recall to mind God's loving kindness, compassion, and faithfulness and have hope? Why should I worry and fret when I can cast all my anxiety on Christ who cares for me? Why should I ever be in bondage knowing that there is liberty where the Spirit of the Lord is? Why should I feel condemned when the Bible says I am not condemned because I am in Christ? Why should I feel alone when Jesus said He is with me always and He will never leave me or forsake me? Why should I feel accursed and that I am a victim of bad luck when the Bible says that Christ redeemed me from the curse of the law, that I might receive His Spirit? Why should I be discontented when, like Paul, I can learn to be content in all my circumstances? Why should I have a persecution complex knowing that nobody can be against me when God is for me? Why should I feel worthless when Christ overcame sin on my behalf, that I might become the righteousness of God in Him. Why should I be confused when God is the author of peace and He gives me knowledge through His indwelling Spirit? Why should I feel like a failure when I am a conqueror in all things through Christ? Why should I let the pressures of life bother me when I can take courage knowing that Jesus has overcome the world and its tribulation. You want to do a, a little exercise? Take your pen and mark the first phrase of each one. Why should I let the pressures of life bother me? Why should I feel like a failure? Why should I be confused? If you go back and do that, you will discover many of those giants, many of those lies that Satan throws at us, men and women, mothers and non-mothers, that constantly Satan is throwing at us to try to get us off base. When God has said otherwise, why should I feel like I'm a failure when God says no, you're not. I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. But Russell, I don't feel like I'm more than conqueror. Well, guess what? Say it till you know it. Say it because God says it. Repeat it over and over and over. But Russell, you don't know my situation. And guess what? I may not. But he knows every situation. He knows everything that's happening. Let me give you a third thing. I need to get to know God as He wants to be known. Sometimes we get this idea that God is this way out there, hidden mystery, doesn't want to be known. In fact, some religions in the world tell us that God is so far removed from us, we can never know Him fully. And yet, the God that the Bible presents is a God who not only wants to be known, He can be known. He says, call on me and I will answer. He says, seek and you will find. Ask and you will receive. Knock and it shall be opened. He said, you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart searching getting to know have you noticed that in a friendship if you don't spend time with each other 
you don't really get to know each other very much. But when you do spend time, you do get to know each other, it can be years that you haven't seen each other. And yet, bam, immediately, it's right there. It's right there. I need to get to know God. I need to fully understand the goodness of God, the sovereignty of God. Everything God does, one day I'm going to figure out it was the very best thing. The holiness of God, the wisdom of God, the justice of God. Listen, listen very carefully. Nobody is going to get away with anything. God will make it right. The love of God. The faithfulness of God. So many of us, if we were just to open it up to testimonies today and say, I want you to tell me, what do you know about these things? The goodness, sovereignty, holiness, wisdom, justice, love, and faithfulness of God. And we could get tons of people telling stories about what's happened. And it's, it's all looking backwards. It's all looking at what God did. The rear view mirror is really good. You know where the problem comes in? Is remembering that when we're in the midst of chaos. Remembering that when we're in the midst of trouble. Remembering that when we are surrounded by enemies and situations that threaten to destroy us, to destroy our life, to destroy our family, to destroy our security, to mess everything up, that's when it's hard. But that's when it's most needed. We need to know Him. John Phillips said, Let us remember that when our circumstances seem to frown, that God is watching. When we cannot sleep at night, when we pace the floor agonizing over a lost loved one, a wayward child, a threatened layoff, God is watching. He is mapping out our footsteps, gathering up our tears. God is there. I want to remind you of something that I've quoted at, I believe this is the third time this year, but I think it is so important. The whole outlook of mankind might be changed if we would all believe that we dwell under a friendly sky and that the God of heaven, though exalted in power and majesty, is eager to be friends with us. This is not the God that the world talks about. This is not the God that we feel, the one with the big mallet waiting for us to stick our head up and then whack us on the head. That's not God. That's not, that's not the real God. And we need to get to know God. Not just the God of the good times. The God that doesn't change in the bad times I need to remember David's words this I know God is for me God is for me I've learned that when you read a phrase like that at different times, I need to emphasize different parts of it. For example, just listen to this. God is for me. God is for me. God is for me. God is for me. You see the difference? You see, it's the same four words. But at different times, you and I need to, to see different parts of that phrase. Because it is, it is this reality that God is for me. 
that should lead me to praise Him. It is this reality that God is for me that should lead me to trust Him. It is this reality that God is for me that should undergird my faith, my hope, and my love, regardless of the circumstances around me. Because God is for me. Would you, would you say that with me? Ready? God is for me. Would you do me a favor? As we say it one more time, would you put a special emphasis on whichever one of those four you most need right now? Now, now look at it. Because sometimes you're, you're thinking, well, if I had all this, all that, no. What, what you really need is God in this situation. When you're doubting whether God even knows you're around or knows what you're going for, maybe it's the is that you need. When you're wondering if God is actually on your side or maybe He's pushing against you, maybe that's the time when you need to know if it's for or not. And maybe you think He's forgotten you. That God seems to be with everybody else and taking care of all their things. But somehow He's forgotten me. Can we say it again? And you, just, I mean, it'll all sound the same to the rest of us. But you know which one you need the most right now. Ready? God is for me. Would you do it again? God is for me. Would you bow your heads, please? The truth of this verse lies when we know that God is our Heavenly Father. Not just the Creator but the Heavenly Father. And it says that the only way we can call Him Father is that when we accept His Son Jesus as our Savior, we get the right to become the children of God. Maybe someone is here this morning and you're, to be honest, you're just not sure. May I say that God loves you so much that He says, I have proven my love to you by sending my Son to die in your place. And I would love for you to be known as mine. Is there anyone here today that says, Russell, I've never accepted Jesus as my Savior. But today, I would like to pray to receive him as my Savior. Is there anyone at all you would raise your hand right there? I want to pray for you, with you. Is there anyone at all? Anyone at all? Then may I say this? I know there's a lot of stuff going on in a lot of people's lives. Say, how do you know? Well, because we live in a very difficult world and stuff happens. Now, some of you, some of you, you know that you've moved the circle of where God wants you and you've moved away from that. May I say that God still loves you? And, and maybe right now nothing bad has seemed to happen, so you think you're kind of safe. And it's not that God's going to just zap you. It's basically the seed you're sowing will bear fruit, and they won't be pleasant. Why not take the step back and say, I want to go back and be where God wants me. I want to live within the circle of His Word and His ways. 
Why not do that today? Some of you here today are going through stuff and it's not of your own making, but it's just stuff. It's, it's, it's things that are going on and, and you're, you're just trying to make it. You may not even see the light at the end of the tunnel. May I say this? There is a light and it is God. It is God. And today, could I invite you to say, Lord, I believe in you. And I believe that God is for me. We're going to take a moment as Janet plays. And maybe stuff you're going through or stuff you see on the horizon. But you would just like to come up here and pray and say, Lord, I'm affirming all those things that Russell said today. All those things that David wrote about so many years ago. I am coming to you. I'm bringing it to you today. Would you come and then we'll have a time of prayer.